We are we are now live on YouTube. That's okay. Yeah, thank you, thank Chelsea. You. This on first. Um, good evening and a warm welcome to the Rushcroft Borough Council's Governance Scrutiny Group Meeting. Uh, I would like to remind everyone that the meeting is being live streamed on YouTube. Uh, a recording of the meeting will be available afterwards on the Council's YouTube channel. In addition, under the local authorities' executive arrangements, meetings and access to information regulations 2012, other people may film, record, tweet or blog from this meeting. The use of any such images or sound recordings is not under the Council's control. OK, uh, so a very warm welcome to um, everybody, uh, to all our members uh, of the uh, group and all our guests this evening as well. Um, welcome uh, Gurpreet, uh, Gurpreet Dillay, who's uh, our, uh, from our Council's Internal Auditors BDO, um, and David, uh, David Hoos, who uh, is a partner from Mazars, our external auditors. Welcome this evening. Um, also welcome to um, our officers who are supporting us this evening. Uh, we've got the Director of Finance and Corporate Services, Peter, um, Sarah, uh, sitting next to me on my right, our Service Manager, Finance, and also, I forgot my name now, it's Katie. Katie, Katie Brennan. Uh, Katie, welcome uh, in terms of some of the items you're supporting as well. And also Tracy, who's uh, supporting us in terms of keeping us to time and making sure we, uh, we cover the agenda. Um, also, welcome, uh, Councillor. Charlotte. Oh, Charlotte. My apologies, and of course, Charlotte, who is with us this evening as well. Um, and uh, to my left, we've got Penny Gowland, Councillor Gowland, who is the Vice Chairman of the Committee. Councillor Adair, uh, Councillor Sims, Councillor Beardsall, Councillor Butler. I think that's everybody, isn't it? So, uh, a very warm welcome to everybody, and uh, <clears throat> we have a. Packed agenda, uh, quite a number of uh, items on today's agenda as always. Uh, so we will crack on. And uh, before we do anything else, can we take any apologies for all uh, absence, uh, Tracy? Thank you, Chairman. We have apologies from Councillor M. Stockwood, Councillor J. Stockwood, and Councillor L. Howitt and Councillor K. Shaw. But we have Councillor Butler here substituting for Councillor Maureen Stockwood. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Um, <clears throat> And do we have any declarations of interest to declare from our members this evening? No hand showing, so I'll take that as a no. Uh, in which case, uh, we will move on to item number three, which is minutes of our meeting held on the 24th of November, uh, which, uh, are, which are on pages one to six in our pack. Do we have any comments, amendments, observations, or matters arising from those minutes? No? OK. Uh, Tracy will take those as agreed then, and I will sign those before the end of this uh, this evening. That takes us to the substantive items on our agenda this evening, the first of which is our third internal audit progress report, uh, which is contained on pages 7 to, 20, 7 to 24 of our pack. Um, and I will ask Gurpreet Dille, who is here from BDO Internal Auditors, to to take us through any key highlights before we have a discussion and uh, any debate around item number four. Thank you, Gopri. Thank you. Uh, so the first paper is our progress report uh, that's in the pack. So what this outlines is there is one report that's been issued to this committee around main financial systems, a really positive report, and I'll go through some of the key highlights in a moment. Uh, there are four reports which are uh, in draft, safeguarding, sustainable warmth, project management and channel shift. Uh, our overall KPI uh, is to have all reports issued and finalised by the end of March. Uh, we're on track to do that. We're hoping to probably get one more to this committee. Unfortunately, we didn't quite get there, but we're on track to make sure that they're all done. And obviously for the next committee, you'll have our uh, head of internal audit opinion as well, uh, along with those. And there are a couple of those reports um, that are kind of in the reporting stage um, and so they should be finalised uh, should be finalised soon. So from an overall progress point of view, you can see the table which is on page 16 of the packs and really positively pretty similar to last year. Everything's coming out as moderate and substantial. Obviously, we issued a substantial opinion, our head of internal audit opinion last year. Obviously, we'll talk with management in the coming weeks as to where we might be with that opinion, but 
we're not going to be far off probably where we were in the previous year. It's it's been very positive this year as well. Uh, but that will be a discussion for the next uh, for the next committee. So the report that we have issued was around main financial systems. Uh, so we've issued a substantial, which is our highest opinion, on the design of controls and then also on the effectiveness. You'll see on the uh, on the scope, it sets out the different areas that we've reviewed, particular risks around general ledger risks around access, um, accounts payable, and then also access control risks as well. You'll see on the following page, which is page 18 of your packs, uh, some of the strengths that we've identified to the council have a financial regulations document. It was reviewed back in February 2022. It's up to date, uh, and we were content that that's uh, sufficiently uh, robust. Uh, and when we look to areas such as accounts payable, as it notes further down the page, um, payments were made to, from the transactions that we've looked at to suppliers within a good period of time. Um, sometimes it does; it can be an indication of uh, challenges where payments to suppliers are made, but they're taking a lot longer. We weren't identifying that from our testing. And so actually the design in terms of financial regulations through to are they being approved effectively and actually paid on time in terms of accounts payable, we didn't find any significant concerns with any of that. We do have three low level findings, which are on page 19. Uh, summarised there. I think previously the committee talked about also seeing the management responses, so we have that in the right-hand column uh, on page 19. So there's there's three low findings. I'll pick up on a couple of them. Um, when we did our testing of uh, transactions on the e-financial system, uh, it shouldn't be the case where somebody is a requisitioner and an authoriser. There's only one case where that was where that we, we identified that I think someone had changed roles and um, uh, it hadn't been picked up that they had both relatively trivial because actually the transaction was entirely appropriate the rest of our testing didn't identify concerns and management will implement a checking process just to see uh, if there are any uh, other individuals with that but we're, we're content that that's a, a low level finding and then also on procurement cards we feel there's probably some guidance or reissuing of guidance to individuals on the internet just about what is eligible spend and what isn't we didn't find any concerns with transactions we had seen but I think actually reinforming people and just expanding on that guidance as to what uh, is and isn't allowed. But again, um, there are target dates there and we'll be following those up um, through to this committee. So overall, we didn't find um, particular concerns with the financial systems, uh, substantial opinion on uh, both. I'll pause there on the progress report because then the separate paper is around um, the internal audit strategy so that's probably a separate item, so I'll pause on uh, on that for now. Thank you, Gurpreet, for that uh, overview. Um, I'll open the uh, uh, open it up to the floor for members in terms of any questions for Gurpreet or any observations on the internal audit progress. Councillor Beetle. Thank you, Okay, we're on. Okay. Uh, right, so yeah, my question is to the officers there. I see that there are time scales put in on those um, three actions. Uh, are they now implemented, those actions? Because that, I think the implementation date was the 31st of Jan. Yeah, I, I can briefly pick up on that. So to this committee, we issue a follow-up report. It wasn't due for this one. We issue it twice a year. So to the next committee, there'll be a follow-up report. Um, so all of those actions will pick up and then um, report on to this committee. So management have confirmed that they would have it done by the end of January. Um, we will be following up on that. We do focus on high and mediums. Um, I, I'll check back with my audit manager whether we look at lows. I, I, I don't think we do actually. I think we look. Oh, we we do pick up on lows. Yeah, as well. on the last okay. one we have got lows. Okay. 
So to the next committee, it will then show, we will go to officers and say, can you confirm and show us the evidence that that is done? And then we will report to this committee which one of those are complete or not. It just wasn't due for this committee uh, around this time. As the date was 31st Jan, do we actually know if they've been completed or not? Yes, we have completed the management um, responses. So we've had guidance and um, also a lot of them, the checking that is in, in place now to check that those things are done. OK, any further questions for Gurpreet on the internal progress or the internal audit? Well, just one thing from me, actually, Gurpreet, um, you've already referenced it, and I had picked it up during my review of the papers, but the, 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 the requisitioner and authoriser um, issue that you picked up, I think the value was £15,000, and your sample size was um, one in, in 10, I think it was, you referred to. I mean, I, I know you said it's trivial and, and the system wouldn't normally allow it, but it, in the event of uh, uh, an unscrupulous you know, member of staff and if they were able to bypass the system and there were 10 incidences where they could actually do that, that doesn't, you know, it does equate to a large amount of money. Uh, yes, and then management might provide a comment on this one as well. There are other controls within the authority, such as budget management, uh, and in budget management meetings, if somebody went and did that, somebody would see that this has gone over what the budget was for the year. So there'd be other controls that would identify if somebody was doing that. Uh, obviously, we have a good sense of the authority's control environment. And so if, if that did happen in this one, we've looked at the, uh, the reason for the spend and actually it's sound. And you can see that I think it was a change in staff members' role and therefore it's just been missed off. Um, hence, we feel that it's low. In theory, that could be true, but there are other controls that would mitigate against any excessive uh, concerns. Yes, sorry, just to follow up on that, and like Gopreet says, there are other controls in place, but in this particular case, although the system had um, the requisition and authoriser down for the same um, post, which was, like you say, it was a just transfer of a person, mm. and it was all within the, account, uh, within the council, they actually, the system will not allow you to process that order in the system from one to the other, so it won't let you email yourself that requisition so you okay. can't approve unauthorized anyway even though they were set to the same one that's fine thank you I, th I think the report did go into that but just to you know i think for assurance and to uh, really spotlight that there are additional controls behind that so thank you for clarifying um i, I think in terms of the internal audit um, um progress we're we're on track and on plan from uh, from the timetable and uh, in terms of the number of I think it's nice to see there's quite a few that have received the substantial assurance on both effectiveness and design so uh, um, if there aren't any further points from members then uh, we are asked <clears throat> to note the progress report which we have duly done we've had a few uh, discussion points around it so we'll record that as uh, as noted in the recommendations thank you and thank you, Gurpreet, which moves us on to uh, on to you again, I think, in terms of the uh, internal audit strategy item number five. Yep. So um, before the start of the new year, we issue our internal audit plan, uh, which sets out the internal audit strategy for the next three years. So the names of the reviews that we'll be looking at for the next three years, but probably more critically, actually, what we intend to look at from the 1st of April 2023 to the 31st of March 2024. Um, so what you'll see within this paper, um, particularly from page 44, it starts on, are the names of the reviews in next year's plan. Uh, in the pages that precede that, you'll see the three years there uh, as well. Um, probably just for context, in terms of what we do here, we do take into account the authorities' risk register, previous discussions that we've had, reviews that we've done previously, uh, discussions with Pete and Sarah as well, uh, who would have seen the, the plan before coming here to committee, and just our wider knowledge of the local government sector and what we're seeing is, you know, particular reviews that are either of higher risk, et cetera. And so all of that feeds into our development uh, of the plan. Uh, so if there are any particular questions about process, we can, we can go into those. But as I mentioned, on page 44 is where the detail uh, sits. So it sets out a number of different reviews uh, against um kind of areas which are linked back to the corporate risk register so main financial systems we've talked about so it talks about that for next year but a focus on uh treasury management um other areas around the fraud report which is an annual report that we do so similar to main financial systems that will come back to this committee uh, uh in the next year's plan uh, a focus on income 
Um, so there's the Rushcliffe Oaks crematorium uh, income and then uh, country parks income as well. Uh, areas we haven't looked at previously, uh, but are key areas for the authority. So we'll be um, focusing on those as part of next year's plan uh, and also a focus on IT general controls. I think just generally across the sector, we're seeing challenges around IT general controls. We have seen some failures within other authorities, and so therefore it's something that we should be looking at uh, here as well to, to, to review the arrangements. But as a whole, it, it equates to a, a plan of 150 days, which is then summarised at the end of uh, at the end of this. And what we ask the committee today is to consider this plan and to uh, uh, hopefully approve what we have here in, uh, in the plan, but then also to approve what's in Appendix 1 on page 50, which we issue each year with our plan, which is the uh, internal audit charter. So in line with public sector internal audit standards, um, we are required to issue our charter each year, which confirms how we as a firm remain independent, objective, uh, and meet the requirements of the public sector internal audit standards. Uh, there's nothing significant that's changed from the previous year. Video uh, were subject to a five-year external review from the Institute of Internal Auditors. We were judged in the top quartile of firms and passed every parameter that they checked us on. So from a quality point of view as a firm, we have been assessed um, uh, and, and passed that process. But it's to us as committee to consider the plan and uh, approve that, and then also separately to consider the charter and to ask for approval of the charter as well. So I'll, I'll pause there, uh, taking the plan as read, uh, and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Gopri. Um, <clears throat> do we have any comments on the proposed internal audit strategy before we consider whether it's approved or not? It's a very good question, Councillor Adair. I had it on my list as well, so maybe I don't know whether the officers or Gurpri wants to reference that, but <clears throat> it's something I had also noted in terms of uh, uh, it has come in-house, obviously. I think it was September last year, wasn't it? So in terms of the bedding in of, of um, that sort of function within the council, is that something we will be looking at and, and to, to what level of detail, Gurpri, I suppose, is a question. Um, so I'm happy to provide an initial comment. It's not within the uh, within the three year plan, but happy for us to reconsider if uh, to be, if you want to make a, if there's any commentary on that one. Yeah, the obviously streetwise. In, in terms of how we report on the success of streetwise, we're doing that through and for financially is through the budget. So when you look at the budget papers at full council next week. Um, you will see in the transformation program we've got a, there's a two hundred thousand pound target for streetwise to in terms of generating additional income. So it sort of manifests itself in the budget. And then in terms of the performance, obviously when we do our the performance aspects of the of, 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 of that go to COG. So we have the finance and performance report that goes to corporate overview group, then there should be some performance indicators that would relate to streetwise. And so that's how in terms of the governance around it and that. Um, I suppose really it's whether it's obviously it's not in the program at the moment. It doesn't mean you know we could look at adding something in uh, if members are, are minded, or alter the alternative is it could be it could go some to scrutiny. It could be a scrutiny review of it or, or scrutiny reports. So there's different ways because when we look internal audit doesn't necessarily cover everything. What we're trying to do obviously cover the main risks to the council where we can. Um, the program. One thing I will add as well about this program it is. Whilst it's not not necessarily set in stone anyway, even now, you know, if something happened during the year, uh, then things can change. So there's there can be some ebb and flow, depending on uh, circumstances. Um, so so there's different ways that streetwise can be looked at. Internal audit, one of them, but really the the if you like the control in terms of its finances and how how that's impacts on the council and its performance is really through our normal. A governance process of finance and performance reporting. I, th 
I think the, the issue for me is, is more the timing of doing it. Cause I know, know what you're saying, because I, I did want to embed it and then want to see how it's doing. So we're in it, the early stages. It's probably whether it goes in this year, it might be perhaps better for next for, for the following year once we've seen a you know eighteen months and it's we can see the progress. Yeah, but that, that's what I'm saying. That the normal governance processes, if there are issues, then the the performance and financial processes should identify if there are issues. Okay, I just want to. So, so sorry, because because this is, whilst it is predominantly focusing on next year, there is a three-year aspect to this. So yeah. we can talk through perhaps look adding it in, but perhaps for next, not for the this financial year, but the following financial year, and amend the program accordingly. Um, Councillor Dare, I think that um, the point you've raised, uh, I must admit, I had it down as well um, to to sort of clarify. And I I think Pete, your your response in terms of the governance performance will be already sort of built into our mechanisms and whatever in terms of the government sort of processes. But uh, I, I do agree with Councillor Adair. I think it needs to be probably built into the audit plan at some stage. Maybe it is too early this year. It needs a little bit of time to sort of settle down and embed, embed itself. But uh, hopefully in terms of the performance and any hot issues which might arise in the meantime will be picked up by management and the executive, um, I think. I was just having a look through um, in terms of the uh, the risk correlation to our risks and so on. Uh, where, where does it appear, Charlotte, you might be able to answer this. Uh, is it actually, I thought I'd seen it, I can't find it now in the papers in terms of uh, on the uh, on the table of green, amber and red, is the bringing in of uh, streetwise uh, on the corporate risk register and if so, where where does it sit on that? It sits on the opportunity risk at the moment. So it's in the latter part of that report rather than That's in the main table. Yes, yeah. So so there is clearly a, a big impact if if we don't do it successfully, there is a lot of opportunity or you know potential sort of benefit to the organization which will be lost. So Pete, can we leave that with officers then to maybe propose with Gurpreet when that might might sort of if, if that's okay, Councillor Adir, in terms of the point you've raised built into the audit plan. Any any further points from members on the proposed audit strategy? <clears throat> if not, um, the recommendation is that the government scrutiny group review and approve the strategy 23 to 26. So it is it is a three year strategy. So we can obviously tweak it uh, moving along. And also the internal audit charter at appendix one, which we referred to. Um, if we're all content with that and uh, happy to approve, then we'll minute that accordingly. Yeah, I don't see any uh, objections. OK, so Tracy, uh, the internal audit strategy is approved uh, for 23 to 26. Gurpreet, thank you very much for your uh, uh, contributions this evening. If you do want to sit and listen to us for another three hours, that's your uh, your decision. But uh, you are welcome to uh, leave if you wish to do so. Oh, are you? Okay, so you're you're going to start your leave early. Okay, thank thank you very much, and enjoy your leave. Okay, uh, moving swiftly through the agenda, then um, it brings us to our external audits and David um, in terms of uh, the annual audit completion report item number six but we do also have the approval of the financial statements uh, as item number seven so happy for you to maybe combine those in terms of your your presentation or uh, overview to us and then we can take them as individual items in terms of the discussion. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll, I'll certainly talk to agenda item six, our reports. I suspect the financial statements themselves probably better coming from officers. So I'll give you a, the headlines from our report. And I'll also give you an update on progress since the report came out for your papers two weeks ago. Um, so actually, the, the key bit to the document, the executive summary, which is page 63 of your pack, sets out where we were, sets out that the audit when these papers were issued was substantially complete. Things have progressed nicely since then. I will update you on that. And the headlines are there, really. The important thing is we expect to be in a position to issue an unqualified opinion on the financial statement. So that's the that's the key point. And whilst our work on value for money, the second opinion we have to give isn't complete yet, 
at this stage, we've identified no significant risks, so we don't expect any adverse reporting on value for money either. Page 65 of your pack sets out what was outstanding at the time the papers were issued. You will see the main issue that was outstanding was just between ourselves and management working through an issue around some accounting, some infrastructure assets. That's subsequently been resolved. Uh, it will give rise to 1.4 million of infrastructure assets being written off. They relate to car park resurfacing assets, um, where one element of the resurfaces in one bit of the balance sheet, the car parks themselves are in another. So there's a little bit of a mismatch. Uh, and that infrastructure assets piece, which again, I'll talk about more broadly later, will also identify some infrastructure assets that probably need shifting into other areas than the fixed asset pot. Not wrong, they're not wrong, they're just misclassified for this year. So no suggestion that the accounts need changing. That's something that will be picked up going forwards. So again, infrastructure assets, um, for those of you who've heard me talk in previous meetings, has been a hot topic for the whole of the sector this year. And that's largely why we're sitting here in February with the accounts still not signed off, because the sector as a whole paused audit opinions until infrastructure assets and accounting for them could be worked out. Uh, certain local authorities identified major issues with infrastructure assets. Yours was not one of them. Um, so actually, in terms of where we are and progress since this report came out, saying to Peter before the meeting, my expectation is now we'll be in a position to sign accounts next week. So things have, things have progressed very nicely from our point of view. The rest of the paper chair, really, section four takes you through those key risks that you'll have heard me talk about when I saw you with the planning document last year. And again, gives you clean bills of health other than the infrastructure point that we've talked about uh, and identifies an issue there with uh, pension scheme valuations. And again, as Peter thinks says in his covering paper, another issue that was completely outside of the council's control. This is an area where you're sitting waiting for Grant Thornton, who are the pension scheme auditors to finish their work. So we can place reliance on their work on the pension scheme members. And that was late in arriving in the course of the year. So two things there that really held up the completion of our audit. And similarly, when Grant Thornton finalised their audit of the council's pension scheme, they did identify significant errors in the assets of that pension scheme, which then had to filter down into the valuation of your share of those assets. So again, a couple of repercussive items really outside of your control that delayed the process. And, and then really, Chair, other things to note, sections five and six are sort of intrinsically linked, really. Two items where we've raised significant actual adjustments to the numbers and internal control recommendations that are associated with them, really. So one adjustment that was identified relating to a four million pound receipt in the year relating to a prior year sale of land. Uh, sale many years ago, Pete, I believe, as well, where actually there were subsequent payments due from the developer once the, the land was developed. Four million pound receipt in into the bank in the year to March 21 with an agreement that another four million would follow a year later. Now, if I apply accruals accounting concept that I would say, actually, you'd recognise all of that in one go and have a debtor for the second part till it comes in. That hadn't how it was accounted for last year. So that's been corrected in these accounts. So no impact on reserves, revenue funds to carry forward, just a correction to some capital accounting from a previous year. And you'll see the other item there that we've raised an adjustment on. Again, doesn't impact on the results for the year, just relating to bank payments around the end of the year and how they were reflected in the debtors and creditors numbers at the year end. So there's another adjustment there, really. So those are the only two things we've had in terms of big actual adjustments. Section seven chair, again, our reporting on value for money, things I said at the top, not completed yet, nothing to bring to your attention at this point in time. Uh, just remind colleagues that if typically we have 90 days from the date we sign our opinion on the accounts to finalize our reporting on value for money. So our reporting on value for money, I would suspect, will come to the next meeting of this, this committee. But at this stage, nothing in my mind that I'm expecting we're going to flag any issues on. So I'd just pause there, Chair. Sorry, that's quite a detailed overview because there is quite a lot in that document. See what questions colleagues have. Thank you very much, uh, David, for highlighting those key points in your um, audit letter to us. Uh, so I'll open the floor up to members if we have any comments, questions or clarifications on the uh, audit completion. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I, I was actually going to ask the question, David. I'm glad you've confirmed it's going to be next week in terms of uh, actually being able to sign them off. But it, it has been an ongoing issue, I think, in terms of 
recent years with the uh, I think we had an extension to November uh, and then was it March uh, no not March um, I'm getting confused now there was an extension to November but what was the deadline post November then um, if we hadn't signed next week there is no formal deadline thereafter. No, November is the target, if you were, the deadline that the sector likes to apply and wants to achieve. Thereafter, there is no formal deadline. It's just a case of getting them done as soon as possible, Pete, isn't it? Yeah, that's correct. Actually, we are in a fortunate position because there are a few councils that have still got 2021 accounts to sign off and mine 21-22. So uh, um, I was talking to Section 151 colleagues earlier, so they're uh, I think they've got a few more issues than, than we have, shall we say. Um, the, the issue with the dates is it's out of consultation actually for this coming year. So at the moment they do, there's a discussion about is the at the moment the draft accounts have to be done by the 31st of May. Um, so there's consultation whether that will stand and then similarly I guess whether the September date's still going to stand because there are still issues sort of if you like labor type issues with with you know if the, the audit has got the resources for example to actually complete audits particularly for those areas where those accounts are one or two years now are you know behind and which are cool as you can imagine trying to audit something that's two years ago is even you know harder than one year ago in terms of of because often with the, the staff that were involved have perhaps left those authorities as well, which creates more issues. So uh, um, I think the issue, the challenge for me for this year is hoping that we can, I mean, I'm hoping we'll sign off by the end of September. Um, there is this perennial issue at the moment, about, particularly about the pensions work uh, and, and making sure that the, the auditors, Mazars, or you know that we've got that mechanism if you like with Grant or they've got a mechanism with Grant Thornton who are the auditors of the pension fund uh, for Nottinghamshire and and hoping that there's no we can there won't be any delays there but perhaps David if I don't know if you've got any comments on that. I think it's something we continue to work quite closely with Grant Thornton to make sure they deliver and meet our timetables because we are wholly dependent on them. Um, clearly with the changes to auditor allocations going forwards the one thing I can say is that won't be an issue from 24 onwards. Yeah. And just to explain what David means by that, so from 24 onwards, Mazars are also auditing the pension fund because they've taken on the county audit. So hopefully those, if you like that potential, well, I suppose it is a barrier at the moment, but that, that should hopefully be removed. I think, Pete, where we have that in other parts of the country, where we know that other audit firms are wholly dependent on us to audit pension schemes, Pension schemes get our primary focus up front. They're the, the audits that we get done first because they they impact on so many other audits happening. Councillor Adair, does uh, does that give you assurance uh, in terms of future? Uh... It is, and it isn't in the. Unfortunately, because there's issues elsewhere, that's also taking more resources elsewhere. So, in a way, there is an indirect consequence because if everything was running swimmingly everywhere else, there'd be less resource there and more resource resource elsewhere. I think from our point of view, <clears throat> Chairman, we come back to the point that actually if, if you know at a point in time there is a subsequent amount of money that is definitely going to come into you, 
and all that it, all that's being delayed is the cash coming in that's income at the point that you know it's coming into you you should book it in your accounts at that point and have the debtor for the receivable coming in down the road so the cash flow doesn't change it's just the accounting period that you recognize the income and the debtor in But we have we have resolved it. Yeah, we, we we did have a difference of opinion, and um, I suppose I took a, an approach that I made my point and and decided to uh, agree with the order to move on. <laughs> I think, Chair, yeah, we, we as Peter said, we had a full and frank exchange of views. How we call it that? Um, and I think effectively, I, I agree from Peter's point commercially. Um, Unfortunately, I have an audit manual to follow that says this is material and therefore I need it to be made as a, a prior period adjustment. I must admit, I took our Section 151 <coughs> officer's uh, uh, perspective as well, but uh, I have noted the uh, comments in the uh, letter. So uh, just in terms of materiality, where, where does that fit in terms of the amount? I think, again, back to discussions Peter and I have had over the years as well, our materiality number for local authorities is typically based on your as a percentage of your revenue expenditure. So for Rushcliffe, because you don't have a housing revenue account, actually your expenditure number is relatively small compared to other local authorities. So our materiality number is relatively small here for a local authority. So that four million pounds is five or six times material to me. So it, it well, wasn't fractional. It, it was a loaded question because I think, you, you know, materiality is 799,000, I think, which is 2% of OPEX. So uh, it far exceeds that, which is why I asked the question. OK, um, any further comments on uh, on the uh, councillor? Butt? Thank you. Just picking up on the comment that Peter just made, and, and, and I know I'm not normally on this committee, but but to, to hear that you, 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 you've you had your frank discussions with each other, I would have thought is quite a healthy sign, actually, uh, because it because it's showing full, full, full engagement and, and, and uh, understanding and appreciation of the the, the issue. And, and um, yes, you agree to. To differ, well, not to differ, you've agreed. So, um, yeah, I think it's quite healthy now, uh, rather than just letting everything go uh, go through without any sort of uh, disagreement. But just it's just an observation, observation really, from a very newbie to this. Thank you, Councillor Butler. And uh, I, I could have kept very quiet about that, but I think to, to credit to uh, uh, Mazars, uh, David, and uh, Peter, yes, I, I agree with Councillor Butler. I think we've we've had a good discussion and resolution of that. So, okay, if there are no further comments on uh, on the audit completion um, report from David, uh, we are asked to uh, approve the findings of Mazar's audit completion report, uh, which was in Appendix A. Approve the management representation letter, Appendix B, um, and C. Receive at a later date a follow up. Uh, in relation to the uh, significant matters arising, which will which will make its way to us. So, if we are happy to approve all of the above, yeah, okay, thank you very much. Um, just just before we move on, Dave, one final point from on the value for money. Um, sorry, uh, report. I mean, we have ninety days um, to come back, but I think you mentioned you're pretty much almost there. Uh, with that, it, will it be coming before the next meeting or? I think, Chair, there's, there's normally a, a balancing act between that 90 days and how that fits into cycles of meetings as well. So, uh, and, and we're not we, we're not on a bound to say it will take 90 days. The work is significantly progressed, but effectively, because we can divorce it from assigning the accounts, the option is normally taken to get the accounts signed quickly and done and out of the way, and then just finalise on value for money. Um, but again, I think the key message from that on me is if, if we did have concerns, we would be flagging them at this meeting with the formal reporting to follow. We don't have concerns. So the formal reporting should just be relatively clean and for completeness sake. Yes. And I think you mentioned that in your uh, overview, um, which was helpful. Peter, do you want to come? Yeah, I just recall that actually, I think what we did last year, we actually, I think we'll hopefully in the next, I don't know, six, eight weeks when well, firstly, there's another piece of work that the team, David and the team, got to do in terms of the value for money working with us, and we'll be providing information. Uh, so that work will be completed. Hopefully, we should get a, a, a positive conclusion. And then, when we do get the report, we will circulate it to the, the group members. In any case, as soon as we get that report, and then bring it to the 
June, I think it is, the next meeting. Uh, so we'll be bringing it to that meeting. Um, I suppose the, the um, although the so the makeup of this group is going to be slightly different, but uh, um, but we will bring it to that meeting. Thank you very much, David, uh, for the uh, that item. We move now on to item number seven, which is the approval of the um, financial statement. So I will ask our officers here. I think Peter or and or Sarah take us through this one. Thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, David has already covered um, most of the key issues that that are present in this year's account. So the main ones being the delays, um, which are referred to in paragraph 1.3, and also the prior period adjustments in 4.7 and 4.8, which just give a bit more detail as to the reasons behind those. You'll be able to see in the statement of accounts on um, the uh, CIS, the comprehensive income and expenditure statement, and the main statements in the accounts, that where those adjustments have been made, there is an additional additional column so that you can clearly see what numbers have changed from the previous year. Um, there obviously are also the two adjusted misstatements that David referred to and um, that changes have been made. And then at paragraph 4.9, there is a summary of the salient points from the statement. So it basically just gives you an overview of the net revenue surplus, the transfer to reserves, the collection fund reserve transfer of 3.179 million, the creation of the vehicle replacement reserve. It gives um, details of the overall net budget variance. The value of the investments held at the 31st of March, 67.785 million, which is up from the previous year. It details the overall earmarked reserves balances and the general fund balance remaining at 2.604 million. It also then summarises the main areas of capital expenditure and gives the business rates position for the, for the fund at the end of the year and our respective deficits. Talks a little bit about Rushcliff Enterprises and gives the value of the um, contribution of the statement of, into the statement of accounts from Streetwise. And also talks a little bit about the major service development so that you can clearly see from that's Freeport and Bingham Hub, the crematorium, digital by design and carbon reduction measures and summarises that we are under significant financial challenges at the moment. So obviously it's a um, moving feast and we have to make sure that we are um, prudent at all times and that we balance our reserves to remain healthy. Obviously, it's a rather large document, so that's, that section does sort of summarise it quite um, succinctly. If you've got any other questions on any other points, we have done some training, like we said, this evening. So it might be that you have any questions in there, but they are the main points. Thank you very much, Sarah. So uh, I'm sure all members have read uh, 300 pages of our financial statements. I'm expecting lots of questions uh, this evening. So who wants to kick off? Councillor Adair. Councillor Adair. And the two large projects that um, we have just completing and completing, just completing and completing at the moment are the crematorium and Bingham, and those two projects were delivered on budget. And obviously, going forward, any projects that are um, in the appraisal stage at the moment, and when they go through the tender stage, will be at current prices. But we do factor in in our revenue budget elements of increased inflation. There's always a risk with inflation because we can't see where it's going to go, but we do um, budget as well as we can with the, um, the knowledge that we have with a forecast based on our Treasury advisors and where we think the market's going to go. Yeah. I mean, we do. You touch actually almost the, the part of the agenda, the council agenda, when we talk about the budget, because obviously there, there, there is risk around inflation. There's no doubt about that. Uh, although we do, we, we do have contingency within budgets and also we have reserves to deal with those sort of issues so in terms of if you like the financial consequences we're we're well well stocked in being able to deal with inflation as it currently stands thank you councillor any any further questions on the financial statements i just i'd be sorry it's remiss i mean i just want to thank david and the audit team it has been 
and and also the accountants because it has been a quite a painful uh, audit in many ways not least because it's it's the audit started in august and it's just finishing now i mean they haven't constantly been here you do have to do other audits as well um but uh, but it is because it lasts for so long it does put a lot of strain i think strain on the auditors to be fair but also but more, i'm particularly bothered about the strain on the staff and uh and, and we do have to uh you know i, I do try and um uh, try and try and uh, keep them calm at, at certain times uh, and uh and, and get some balance to that and uh um i don't, I don't I think David won't mind me saying you, David's not going to be. This would be his last meet, I think, with us. Um, so I'd like to particularly thank David uh, for his work since since he's been here over the last few years. Uh, thank you very much, um, um, Pete. And uh, just just before I make any closing remarks, uh, I, what, one point I do want to raise, actually, just going back to the council very quickly, um, and it's not not really uh, an issue, but. Uh, uh, it's interesting. I think I noted on page 106 the summary. The uh, the the pension fund changes for 14.2 million has obviously increased our net worth, but clearly that's not something that's going to happen every year, Pete. Um, so I'm just wondering in terms of in terms of the balance sheet and balance sheet sort of movements and uh, so on. Um, what, what do you want to share anything with us in terms of where we think that's going? Because you know. Saying net worth is up 14 million this year is fine, but if it's a result of a pension fund adjustment, um, you know that's obviously an exception. Yeah, if, if you look on page 135, um, you can see there's a graph there uh, which demonstrates that the the position with uh, net worth and position with uh, pension liabilities and long-term assets and Broadly speaking, there's co correlation, but that whilst it's there is an upward tra trajectory, um, the pensions figures do vary massively, depending on the economy and issues like COVID impact on life mortality and things like that. Uh, so they do, you know, I think the previous, if you look to the accounts previous year, I think they've gone down by thirty odd million or something. So they they do go up and down and. Uh, but obviously pensions is a long term situation and uh, it's you can't get almost too hung up by the the, the deviation but such is particularly at the moment with all the risks around inflate particularly now inflation as well and the impact on the, the, in terms of the recession on asset values and those sorts of things that's why i felt that david mentioned the, the issues with pensions one of the reasons we had to have another report was due to some of that if you like even now short term volatility uh, that's occurring um, I think, Chair, that Pete uses the key word on that pension accounting is volatility. You know, th those are numbers that are given to you by an actuary. There is nothing you can do to influence them. And, and they do go up and down according to various economic factors, not least the stock market. Um, and they put massive volatility in your accounts. So I can talk about another sector I work in, further education colleges at July 22, lots of them had pension scheme assets. <laughs> The numbers have bounced back so far the other way that they've got huge assets on their balance sheet, not liabilities. The only thing that is certain, I suspect, is that by you get to the next year end, as Peter said, it will bounce back the other way. The key thing to note really is it's not a cash item. It's, it's valued very differently to the triennial valuation that's done for that scheme, which is the important valuation because that's the one that sets contribution rates. So this is very much an accounting valuation solely for that basis and just needs to be taken with that pinch of salt really. just, just to add I mean, it's a good point david just made then again i refer to if you look at the budget papers and the assumptions we do have the latest triennial figures for pensions which actually have shown an improvement so whilst the primary rate's gone up slightly the secondary rate's gone down quite a bit in terms of the pensions so if you look on if when you get around to looking at the budget papers there's a, an assumption section and you'll see there what what the latest pension figures are, but the pension fund, certainly for Rushcliffe and for a lot of the authorities within it, has been performing well. And the recovery is that because rates have been going up, it's in a, a much more stable position than it was overall. 
Thank, thank you, David and Peter, for clarifying that. I mean, I, 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 the only reason I raise that is I, I think it's important for members to understand uh, it could be very easy to look at that and suddenly think, you know, well, we're, we've got fourteen million pounds worth more of assets or, or whatever. But it is more of an accounting entry than uh, than anything else. So important to highlight. But uh, uh, D David, also uh, from myself uh, as chair of this group, thank you very much for your contributions over. The last few years that I've been here and uh, all the various presentations that you've made to us and for ensuring our staff are still alive after this painful audit this year in particular. But uh, uh, thank you for all of your uh, efforts. And uh, just before we let you go, we'll, uh, we'll do what we were asked to do, which is uh, the recommendation is that we approve the statement of accounts for 21-22, uh, which were contained within Appendix 1, including the annual <coughs> uh, governance statement at Section um, B. Now, that, just to remind members, is something we had a look at, I think, in June, and we, we did actually approve the annual uh, governance statement at that meeting, or recommended to Council, I can't remember which bit, but uh, um, uh, that was the 30th of June. So we're asked to approve the statement of accounts, including the ASG. Um, and B, if there is still work uh, out, uh, outstanding on the accounts, we are delegating authority to the Director of Finance and Corporate Services to make any necessary changes uh, resulting from the review of the infrastructure assets, David, which you mentioned. Uh, uh, did you want to come in? Yes. Just to say, Chair, that effectively in the period since these papers came out, we've had the updated draft accounts, we've reviewed them, we're perfectly happy. We have no further changes to be made. In, in which case, the recommendation B then um, is, is not relevant. Uh, so it is just going back to recommendation, the first one, which is to approve the statement of accounts for 21-22, including the annual uh, government statement. So if we're all happy to approve that, we will minute that accordingly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tracy. Those are approved. So, David, once again, thank you very much uh, for uh, being here this evening and for uh, uh, the last few years and taking us and navigating us through the uh, financial uh, maze uh, every year. Um, again, I will make the offer to you. It's up to you whether you take it or not. If you want to continue to be a part of this meeting and listen to us going through the rest of the items, your call. But uh, if not, you're free to leave. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. I think I'll go and cough a splutter somewhere else. Rather than... <laughs> but thank you very much. OK. Uh, Yes, I'm going to cough and splutter somewhere else as well now. So uh, we're going to cough and splutter together. <laughs> but David, I did, uh, Peter, I didn't make the offer to you. <laughs> no, I know you did. You did mention it earlier on. So uh, yes, do carry on. Thank you. OK, well, actually, we're not doing too badly for time because uh, despite our officers scaring us with such a huge agenda and uh, 346 pages in the pack, uh, we're navigating our way through quite uh, quite well, I think. So um, thank you, David, and thank you, Pete. So we're on to item number eight now, actually, which is uh, which is a risk management report. And I'll ask uh, Charlotte, and I won't forget this time, Charlotte, I apologise for really not uh, introducing you, but over to you for the risk management report. Thank you very much, Chair, and good evening, Group. I shall hopefully hurry you along on your agenda speed through. Um, this is your standard report, so you get this one twice a year, um, the basis of which is to report on risk management activity um, since your last meeting, and that was in November. It has a summary of the changes made to the risk register by the internal risk management group, which is our executive management team. And it states that the current risk register has 41 corporate risks and 27 operational risks. It also includes four operate up opportunity risks. Um, Appendix A contains the risk registers. There are no new risks to report this time round. One risk has been removed, and that's in relation to Bingham Arena, which has been completed and opened. Um, one, risk, one risk has increased, um, which is a loss of income in our planning team due to variations in the number of applications coming through and three risks have decreased um, failure of partnerships failure to safeguard children and adults and violence to staff and that is because of changing circumstances and um, greater levels of internal control over those aspects in terms of the risk register we have seven red risks those are our highest rated risks one of those is streetwise which councillor verdi mentioned earlier on which is also an opportunity risk and I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you have on the risk registers this time round. 
I'll hand the floor to our members. Councillor Bidzel. Um, <clears throat> on page three on the risk register, I'll show you on my phone, actually. Yeah. Impact reduced two to one, question mark, but no risk or anything identified, so I'm not sure what that is. I haven't spotted that. Thank you very much. Homes for Ukraine. I'm making a note. OK, fine. Well spotted, uh, Councillor Beardswell, and yeah. contrary to popular. Lots of question marks highlighted in yellow. <laughs> <laughs> I must admit, I, I thought I'd gone through the report in quite a lot of detail, but I didn't pick that up. So uh, it's because there's lots of other colours, I think, in this particular <laughs> item. That's why it's a bit off putting. But uh, do we have any any questions or points to raise with Charlotte in terms of the current report? Yeah. Councillor Sims. Thank you very much, Councillor Sims. Um, it's not on the risk register. I will take it back to the risk management group to see if they would like to include it. Um, I suspect what they might say is something along the lines of we put our standards up so that we make sure that we have safe taxi drivers for our residents. Whether they choose to go to Wolverhampton or not is entirely up to them. Yeah, uh, well, uh... Can I just, Sarah, yeah, sorry, just to add in there, um, I do recall the um, issue that you're referring to, but I don't think it's a new, it's not a new um, process. I think it's been available for a long time for taxi drivers to be able to go to other districts and, um, and other councils to get their, their licences. And as of, as of this point, we haven't seen any effect on the taxi licence income. So in terms of asking the team, yes, do we want to make it as a risk? I would personally say at this, at this point, it doesn't look like a risk to us. Standards going up, even higher, didn't they? Just we spoke about it. Yeah. We're discussing the latest um, legislation, but actually, I, less the risk of the uh, finance to the council, but more, in my opinion, the risk to the population if they're using a lower quality taxi service in terms of safety and this whole thing so maybe i'd like to adjust your point or add to it for the risk register consideration because if <clears throat> if we've got external taxes that are bypassing rushcliff high standards to use a lower easier standard to obtain surely that's a risk to the people using the taxes in rushcliff so Perhaps it, it should be considered on that basis too. Um, Sarah, do you want to come back on that? And then I think Councillor Garland yeah, wants to come in as well. Sorry, I was just going to make the point, the point that you make there is like the enforcement issue, I guess. 
So you've got um, taxis that you can't stop which taxis come into Rushcliff or any other part of um, the district. But what we can do as a council is focus our enforcement. So I know sometimes they go out on night um, assessments and they'll, they'll pull taxis over and check them and make sure they're safe. So that's, I guess, where our approach would be in terms of, because there's nothing else we can do, I guess, with where they actually get their licence from. But unless it's on the risk register being reviewed, then we don't know. And you don't know. So, so just I, before I bring in Councillor Gower, I, I think, Charlotte, you're going to take this away and just consider with officers and staff what, what options we have. And then maybe we can come back uh, with that. But Councillor Gowland, you want to come? Only a really small question. How many taxis to be licensed? Not information I have to have. <laughs> I don't know about Sarah. No. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> fair few, but I don't know the number offhand. Um, Councillor Sims, in terms of the point you've raised, uh, I think Charlotte's undertaken to take that away and uh, consider with officers and staff and we'll, we'll have a, perhaps you could email us uh, because the committee is not going to meet for a while, so uh, maybe email a response to us, Charlotte. Any further comments on the, uh, on the risk report? No, um, just just one point from me, actually, Charlotte, and that is actually just to uh, highlight for the group here that uh, I don't know if uh, Gurpreet referred to this, but uh, the BDO internal audit for our risk management um, process was given a substantial for both design and effectiveness uh, substantial rating. So it's worth noting that um, in terms of uh, in terms of the process. Although I will come back at the next item on on some points that I want to raise, but. Uh, um, just, just going back to one risk, um, uh, Charlotte, on page 266 uh, under 4.6, DEGOA, uh, -E loss of income as a result of planning applications. Now, there was one major refund, and that's increased the risk from three to four, £32,000. I mean, that's one refund, and, and I can see why the risk has gone up. But we've, we've got uh, Councillor Butler here who has been involved with and is currently chair on you, the uh, uh, planning committee is that something to worry about i mean in terms of that is one episode uh, or one incidence of 32000 pounds but that clearly is you know is a moving risk and it could escalate quite rapidly well thank you for that i i, I, uh, I, I can join you yes i do <laughs> Uh, I, mean, I, I don't. I don't have the full details, but my my assumption would be that that was exceptional because it was no doubt a uh, probably a major, a major housing application. Um, I really don't know, but but that would be my understanding. And I but I do know that there has been a pattern over the last year or so or two, as it says in the report, of uh, a reduction in number of planning applications coming in, so big or small. And uh, so, therefore, the associated income obviously goes down as well. But plainly, if you're going to get one like this, and uh, uh, well, it does actually say it's a refund on a major scheme. I don't know what that scheme was. Um, that is exceptional, I would say. It, but, but, but because the vast majority of planning applications are your relatively small ones, where the planning fees are, are really quite low, in the hundreds of pounds as opposed to the thousands of pounds. So I'm wondering whether we, uh, in terms of that risk rating, Charlotte, going from three to four, if it is on the basis of an exceptional item, is that appropriate in that case? Um, because it, it, the reason I asked the question is I was concerned, is this a long term trajectory or, or, or things to come? In which case, I would think it's a legitimate you know, increase from three to four. But it, if it is an exceptional, exceptional item and we are aware of it being an exceptional item, then I would challenge whether whether that risk actually moves up uh, on a permanent basis? I think that's a fair challenge, Chair. I think one of the reasons why it perhaps has been put up is to do with the climate that we find ourselves in and whether more people are likely to raise that kind of challenge moving forward. So we're just edging our bets with that one, but I will raise it with the risk management group. Okay, in which case, I think that was a very interesting discussion. Thank you, uh, Charlotte, for that report. and. Uh, in terms of that report, where uh, <clears throat> the recommendation is for us to note the contents of this report and consider and make recommendations on risks that have a red alert status, which we've just done. 
So thank you for your contributions on that one, Charlotte. Thank you for the uh, report. But uh, moving swiftly on, um, I think it's back to yourself with item number nine, which is the draft risk management strategy for 23-24. Thank you very much. Um, so the current risk management strategy is due to expire in April of this year. Um, we have updated the risk management strategy to reflect best practice and also as a result of training that we received last year from Zurich Insurance um, and also as a result of the BDO audit that the chair has already referred to. So the strategy forms the main framework within which our risks are identified and managed and paragraph 4.5 outlines the changes that have been made to the strategy. The draft revised risk management strategy is included at Appendix 1. And just before I hand over for questions, I would also like to talk about a piece of work that we're currently involved in, which will come to you at the next update, which I believe will be in September time. So one of the recommendations from the uh, risk management audit was to revise the wording of our risk management statements. Now, we'd hope to get that piece of work done before the risk management strategy was completed however the two are completely independent and we took a judgment that actually we didn't need to rush that through we could take our time um, but we have been working on that um, and it's very nearly finished so the what you see in September time in comparison with the last report that we just delivered is likely to be a little bit different and at the time I'll make sure that you're aware of the changes that we've made and why but they are reflected in this strategy so I'm more than happy to take any questions I'll ask our members if you have any comments on the draft pr proposed strategy. Paragraph 4.5 um, just follows the things that have been changed. So, um, more comprehensive introduction, explanation of our risk management process, um, reference to the recent training from Zurich and the BDO audit. Um, reference to Pentana, which is the Council's performance management system where risks are collected and, and managed. Information about the monitoring and review process for both risks and the risk management strategy and alterations to the roles and responsibilities to reflect the management structure changes that were made in 2021. Uh, any further points from members? In which case, I'm sorry, Charlotte, but it's coming back to me. I've got I've got a few very brief points. Um, on page 287, 1.3, there's reference to a funding uh, reserve. Uh, 1.3, yes. Um, I've not heard of that before. I just wanted clarification on what that is and how much. So 1.3 in the strategy on page 287, I think it is. So this is this reserve, the reserve provides the opportunity to apply for financial support and creates an incentive for loss control. I'm going to hand straight over to Sarah because she clearly <laughs> I, I, knows I how much is in there so and I'm, I'm not going to. Okay, you are right, um, and you'll see this in your statement of accounts pack as well. Um, we have a risk and insurance reserve that sits currently sits at 100k. Have we ever used it? Good question. Um, I don't recall ever using it because we do have, as Charlotte refers to in the report, we have sort of funds built into our insurance premium where we can draw on the expertise of the in insurers to sort of give us a bit of extra training and that's what we've done in the past but that is there for sort of a, I guess more large scale risks that we want to address. Okay thank you thank you for clarifying that. Um, page 288 the risk um, the risk management process um, the, the, the draft strategy refers to first second and third lines of defense and that's through the the performance clinics that you have the uh, risk management group and us as a group the governance scrutiny group so we meet every three months and I think the uh, risk management group every two months if I if I recall in the report um, I'm not so sure about the performance clinics on, unless they're part of the executive management team uh, meetings which are I presume are well, I, I, I think they're monthly 
the question I had, Charlotte, was just I, I, I was wondering whether the risk management group needs to meet more frequently, because in my experience, uh, you know, risk management, I know you do it on a real time basis as officers and staff and so on. But that formal government structure in terms of those lines of defence, uh, I'm questioning the frequency. That That's my point here. OK, so just to clarify a few of those points. So performance clinics, so this is our first line of defence. I like the way that we describe that. Um, those are done bi-monthly. So every other month, people like Sarah and I, service managers, will sit down um, and challenge each other, report on various risks, performance indicators, tasks and such like. And that's looked at collectively. That then goes up to our executive management team, directors like Pete and Kath. Um, and they will look at that as well and challenge us back regularly. The risk management group, which is um, our executive management team sitting with a different hat on, um, for want of a better expression, they meet twice a year. So they get the report that we've just looked at the same frequency that you do. But because we look at the performance clinics on a bi-monthly basis, if there are any concerns, and if there are any changes to risks, they are looking them on also on a bi-monthly basis. I think that if there was anything significant enough to warrant a risk change, alteration, new risk or whatever, it would be picked up at executive management team and rolled through the process. We wouldn't wait for either of those two points to do it as it is because it's live and because it, it operates in the real world. It's constantly changing what you get is a is a snapshot every six months okay no and that's fair enough i mean uh, you know all, all organizations work in a different way i i raised that in a way because i recall at a previous meeting and i think it was possibly councillor sims or councillor beardsall who who was quite keen to ensure that we were on a real-time basis looking at operational risk and the the register which comes to us here is is a as comprehensive as it can be, and I think you provided that assurance then. And and having seen this proposal for the you know strategy moving forwards, um, uh, that's why I raised it. But I think you know the, the three lines of defence. It's good to see that in the uh, um, in the um, um, proposal. But uh, uh, I think frequency wise, you know, organisations do it differently, and whether it's real time or not. My final point on this, and then I then I will move on. Uh, is actually around the uh, opportunity risk area. Um, so looking at the terms of reference, um, page 294, 4.3, um, I'm wondering, well, I'm suggesting uh, it, including something very specifically around the uh, uh, opportunity risk uh, assessments that we do and having a proactive, uh, you know, activity which actually looks at the realization of those so you referred earlier on for example to the uh, um which one was it now there was one that i raised uh it was uh streetwise, streetwise yes you know the, the, it, it, some of those can be quite significant amounts so i'm wondering whether we include in the terms of reference in in this strategy something around something we could do proactively to to monitor manage and take corrective or mitigating action for the opportunity risks not just the you know the <laughs> usual areas that we consider as risks sarah yeah i just wanted to come back on the obviously the the ident the um terms of reference could possibly include reference to opportunity risk but in terms of monitoring the progress of those is sort of done by the transformation plan so when we have new opportunities that arise, they then tend to become part of that, that programme and then they'll be monitored on a regular basis. So then they go through Pentana through our monitoring system on a monthly basis and also go into the performance clinics, which then feed through the process that Charlotte's just referred to. So there is an element there of, of already being monitored once they're identified. Uh, which is fine, Sarah. Uh, I, I think I was just suggesting that perhaps it's captured and documented that that is part of the strategy. So you've described it verbally um, and you described how it works in reality, but uh, um, it's, it, it's not a major point, but I, I, I thought it would be useful just to have it referenced there and documented in uh, 4.3. Okay, uh, any, more, any more comments on the risk uh, strategy? Council yeah, I think, I think as you, you mentioned my name earlier on in relation to a previous inquiry I had with uh, with Charlotte, I'll, I'll go on record in saying that having reviewed the um, risk management strategy and process, 
I'm more than satisfied with that process itself. Thank you very much, uh, Council Rizal. That's, uh, that's good and positive to hear. So uh, well done, Charlotte and, and the team. OK, well, we'll move then, if there's no further comments, to uh, the recommendations for the draft management strategy. And that is to, uh, for us to consider the risk strategy for 23-26 and approve the risk strategy for 23-26. So if we're all in agreement, um, which I think we are, we'll record that as approved. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, Charlotte, you have the same offer now, which I'm making to every. But by the time we get to the last item, uh, it might only be me sitting here. So uh, I, I better stop being so uh, generous with those offers. But uh, OK, so uh, I think we're doing very well, actually. Um, we're on to item number 10, uh, which is a capital and investment strategy for Q3. Uh, and then related to that is actually item number 11. So, Katie, I'll leave it to you how you want to work work your way through that but that is the strategy for 23-24 so do you want to take the report first or yeah. yeah okay okay thank you everybody um so uh, this is a capital investment strategy quarter three report so um the purpose of this is to summarize the capital investment activities for the period 1st of april to 31st of december 22 the capital investment strategy for 22-23 was approved by council on the 3rd of March and outlines the council's capital investment priorities. Um, the next agenda is the um, capital and investment strategy for 23-24. Um, so just to take you through the main parts of this report. Um, so in paragraph four, um, we talk about the economic forecast. Um, obviously, everybody's aware of this. We've got... Um, the rise in inflation, which is expected to reach 12%, uh, affecting price of fuel, energy and food, and putting pressure on household budgets. Um, as a result, the um, base rate of interest um, was increased to 3.5% and we're anticipating further um, rises in that as well. Um, our Treasury Advisors Link have revised their interest rate forecast and they're forecasting that interest rates will peak at 4.5% in June and then they'll start to tail off from December 23. So with regard to our investment income, at the time of setting the 22-23 budget, the base rate forecast was 0.5%. And so the council budgeted to receive 673,000 um, in investment income, um, but actual in interest earned to the 31st of December was uh, 849,000. And due to the, ra uh, the rise in the rates that we've just discussed, we're expecting it to be 1.2 million um, by the end of the year. Um, Appendix D does give you the details of the Council's current investments, um, if you want to take a look at those. Um, so in order to maintain returns and mitigate risks, the Council continues to diversify um, its investment mix. So we've got um, deposits in money market funds, call accounts, CCLA property <coughs> funds, UK local authorities and diversified funds and um, a larger amount than normal being held in money market funds to ensure liquidity. Um, it's worth noting that in December, we invested 5 million with HSB Global Liquidity Fund, which is one of the new green investment funds, which are where councillors are keen to um, invest in. So that's um, some good news in that area. Um, in light of the cash balances, um, we can continue to rely on internal borrowing and um, we don't need to externally borrow. So the fair value of the council's diversified funds can fluctuate and um, we are currently showing a 1.4 million deficit. The majority of the deficit is um, mitigated by the appropriations to reserves. It does say 0.6 million um, in this report, but that's actually increased now to um, 0.9 million. And we've also got the 0.2 million carried forward from 21-22 underspends. Currently, there's a statutory override in place, um, which means we don't have to account for any um, loss impacting the revenue account. 
and that's been extended for a further two years um, but we are maintaining the reserve to cover that um, being, being prudent. So just looking at the indicators, um, obviously they um, are set out in the strategy and um, the two that we've got is the liability benchmark, which reflects the real need to borrow. Um, and this is in app Appendix B and confirms that we've got no need to borrow over the medium term. And then the net income from commercial service and investments to net revenue streams reflects the council's dependence on investments. And the projected figure is lower than estimated due to changes in the operational start dates for the crematorium and Bingham, rising utility costs and favourable net revenue streams. Um, in terms of commercial investments, the council's target is that it shouldn't exceed 30%. Um, and we're actually just under 20%, which you can see in Appendix C. And that's all of the highlights in that report. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, any comments on... The only thing I would question here is the... And inflation may go to 4.5 percent that may not happen according to what we hear from the bank of england recently where inflation is declining and there's a quite a out there inflation's declining and will decline rapidly over the next few months so are we <coughs> assuming that someone might have might be there and may have taken that into account instead of having more reality to what might happen but, i mean i know you have to pick a period of time when you make these judgments. So we use um, Treasury Advisors Link um, and they advise us on the rate. So they're updated continually. So we change um, our projections. Uh, but the 4.5 is the interest rates, uh, which is going to be the peak. And then it is going to tail off and that be towards the end of the year. Um, 4% at the moment, and it's uh, projected to come down gradually, like Katie says, from 24-25, it'll start to come down again by half a percent. This is what Link are proposing, so that it's back down to 2.5% by 27-28. So, some unknowns, unfortunately, we can't answer this evening, but uh, Captain... Councillor Sims and Councillor Bids, I don't know who was first, but uh, I, I saw both your hands go up. Thank you very much. I, it, was, it was much the, the I, I hadn't mixed up between inflation and uh, interest rates, but when you said tail off, I just wanted to uh, to know more clarity on what tail off means. Does 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 that mean it will you know remain? At two, but, but you've you've clarified it in in between because that could mean a lot of money to the council. You know, if it remains tails off, doesn't go up, uh, or tails off and goes down. You know, and that that's significant amounts of money. So you've just said it's it's forecasting twenty eight to be two and a half percent, which is fantastic. Thank you, Councillor Bid. This is something I've raised before um, during these discussions, and, uh, and I raise it again. And I think one day it will bite the council in the bottom. Um, we have no sight, and I feel personally very strongly about it, we have no sight of whether, we're, whether we've got ethical investments. We don't know at all. I asked the question, and there was never an answer. In fact, the answer was we simply don't know, and, and I think it's an important issue. We could be involved in investment funds that are wholly not ethical from a point of view of the environment, from a point of view of uh, uh, slave labour, sweatshops, child labour, a whole range of social and corporate, corporate responsibility of investment. Most organisations that I deal with, which are large international organisations, this is right on the top of the agenda. It's not ignored whatsoever. We are uh, an organisation representing the health of the population, yet we do not know 
whether or not we have ethical investments. And I would like to suggest that we do know, we should know and investigate that. Because what are we all sitting here for? Saying we're making, yeah, Rushcliffe is a great place to live, yet we're investing. Our investment may be, we don't know, somewhere in in Africa somewhere where kids are running around digging radioactive material out of the ground with being abused, etc. I think I've made my point. Thank you, Councillor Beard. Sarah, do you want to uh, respond to that? Um, moving on to the next item that Katie will talk about, there is um, an item that has been in there for a number of years, point 39 um, in the strategy, that does focus on that we will not knowingly invest in those sort of activities. So organisations that we do put funding to, we do specify, and a lot of them now, particularly with green investments as well, do actually specify that they only invest in certain things. It's, it's difficult and it's not a mature market, particularly with the green side of things, to, to actually measure it. And if you speak to the experts, they'll say there is no um, key at the moment. So there's no, no consistent way of measuring where your green investments are across, um, across different investment portfolios. But we can only go with our, we will not directly invest and then do the best we can in terms of where we, the, the products that we invest in, we read and make sure when we speak to our advisors, we ask them and they feed back to us which organisations are openly stating that they don't invest in those sort of things and then we invest along those lines. Yeah, do do we have a breakdown of, of it? Do you have in writing? It doesn't, it, it just, from what you've just said, there's some good steps being made in terms of you know, you've got some green investments and the policy of not knowingly investing to me doesn't go far enough. It certainly wouldn't go far enough in the corporate world whatsoever. <coughs> you need to know positively what you're investing in, not by default or exception that you might not know. So, but I've made my point. I'll so, uh, I mean, just, just to pick up on that, Councillor Beards, so and, and Sarah, your you, you know your reference to um, um, paragraph thirty nine in our um, proposed strategy. Uh, I think this has come up once or twice in this group before, um, and you know I I, I note the um, the reference to we would not knowingly and so on. But uh, I, I'm just wondering is 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 there a way or is there something um, we can look at in terms of consciously trying to um, you know, identify where our investments are being made. Um, I know it's not easy uh, and I know we have Link and we have um, those firms who do this for us, but um, perhaps the action here is to, uh, is to go away and think about proposals or options where we could take on board what Councillor Beardsall is saying, because this has come up once or twice before and I, I, I think you know, we can at least have a look at what options might be possible. Councillor Sims, do you want to come in? Yeah, I th I th this could go on. I, I agree with Councillor Bersa totally. I don't think as not knowing is is a defence, um, as often is said in, in lots of areas of law, ignorance is, isn't a defence. I think um, we, we need to be mindful of the risk as well to not investing correctly because it could leave egg severely on the council's face if we are found out by whatever means, a good investigative journalist or whatever, that we're not investigating, uh, investing properly and we are talking the talk rather than walking the walk. Um, the other thing that I wanted to go on to was Council Virgil saying ethical. Now, one person's ethical is another person's, you know, to drive a petrol car is not ethical to some people and you should have an electric car. So we need to have a framework of what the council really is, thinks is ethical before we start, because let's face it, we, we live in a woke world at the moment and we need to get that balance of where those ethics are, where this council stands. So I think that is another reason we need to explore this further to improve what is an excellent council further. Thank you, Councillor. Um, thank you. I had a, couple, a point on that. I totally agree with you both. And I think it's surprising. And I, I've tried to check back. I don't think it's on the risk register. And I thought, it should, like you said, it's a risk and it should be on the risk register. And I guess that would focus uh, minds. Um, and you're right. I mean, it's obviously hard to define, but there is another organisation not far from here that has got its hands um, 
burnt really with Russia because Russia is everywhere and that's a really big risk at the moment. So I absolutely agree. I'd just like to ask a completely um, stupid question probably. When the um, interest rate goes up and you get more return on the investment, does that go into um, the running costs or does that stay in the investment uh, section of the accounts? So sorry for my ignorant language. No, that's OK. So the um, returns that we get on it, uh, do you recall on Tuesday when we had the um, outturn position, that's the investment income that we get in that comes in through the revenue account and contributes to us having the surplus at year end. And that's where we're putting some of that money into the pooled investments to cover the, the decline in those at the minute. OK, so that's where I was coming to, actually. So the decline in the investments and the projected decline in the investments looks you know, a bit scary, really, doesn't it? I think to me, as in, if somebody doesn't really know much about it, can can you tell me a little bit about what's been the situation has been previously? Because we can only see forward. And um, where were we? You know, three years ago, four years ago. Um, I don't think I've got history that far. Um, if you, sorry, do you mean specifically on the diverse uh, funds? I'm looking at table two. Um, page. Um, when we talk about the value de declining, you know, in, in Appendix A in that report, that's actually, although the overall investment is is lower by that 1.4 million, that's actually how we generate those returns. So we're seeing all that extra investment income because of that, and over time, the the investment fund will recover. Okay, so again, I'm sorry, I might be being stupid, but page 320, table two, working capital, usable reserves, um, it all looks to be going, available for investment, it all looks to be going in the wrong direction. Is that in the strategy? Um, so. It's table two on page 320. Sorry, I've only got the um, strategy print stuff, is it? No, I think it's that one, yes. Yeah, the CFR, that's that's in the side. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we're, we're <ahead laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's OK. OK, um, so I, I think just summarising, um, so, some, some members of the group have raised um, concerns around the uh, definitions of ethical and, and uh, knowing what is actually being invested where, if, if we could perhaps come back with uh, if I could just say, uh, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> there is plenty of information out there on what is ethical in terms of the corporate world. Um, there's a whole raft of standards on corporate and social responsibility. So I believe the <coughs> action should be that the council develop its own corporate and social responsibility policy. Uh, uh, in relation to investment strategies. That's what I'd like to see as an action from this meeting. And I'd like my colleagues to agree with me on that. Sorry. Yeah, I'll take that forward. And um, just come back on the point about as not knowing, we, we do know exactly where our investments are in terms of the um, institutions that they're invested with. And those organisations do invest ethically and not in those um, specifically excluded areas. It's not that we don't know where they are, but I think it's difficult in some circumstances. And I think we did an assessment last time this came up, um, that we tried to, to pinpoint exactly how much of ours um, we couldn't identify. It's a very small proportion, but it's because when you get into the diversified markets, that money might ne might not necessarily be in where you think it is. And I think that's where it becomes difficult. So, for example, your money might be invested in property and that property might be a car park. That might be deemed for some to be unethical because it links to travel and fuel and fossil fuels. So it, it becomes really difficult. So I see a C point and I'll go back and I'll, I'll check with our, um, our Treasury advisors if there is anything that's been developed since the last time we looked at this. And if they've got any guidance in terms of this um, corporate social responsibility type um, methodology, and I'll, I'll come back with something next time. Yeah, it's a very good idea, actually. Okay. okay, one final point then from Council. Sir. Yeah, I was, ju I was just going to say I've received a letter recently from a local authority pension scheme that I'm a member of, and it's a very thorny issue because they want us to. But really, 
I want my pension to maximise. You know, so it is a very, uh, it's a very thorny issue. Uh, would I want to, a cut of BP and Shell at the moment? Absolutely. But is it ethical? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay, okay uh, that was uh, that was a very, uh, um, I think, useful discussion and debate. So thank you for raising uh, those points. And Sarah will go away and uh, talk to our Treasury advisors and see what options we have. And we've got some ideas around looking at uh, possibly our pension uh, pension fund colleagues as well. So um, in terms of in terms of the report itself, thank you, Katie, for uh, uh, taking us through that. And and I think the story of the year has been and. Uh, I think it is very positive overall, um, and uh, I think well done to the team. Um, you know, particularly when we look at our CFR, the um, you know uh, capital financing requirements, liability benchmark, the commercial income, and so on. It's all looking very positive. So, I think um, overall Q3 report, yeah, still on track. Thank you. Um, we're asked to note the uh, the contents of the report, which I'll make sure I'm looking at the right uh, uh, right uh, item. Um, and the update which we've done. So thank you for that, Kate. Uh, which moves us on to the uh, <clears throat> next item, which is a uh, penultimate one for our agenda today, and that's the capital investment strategy, which I think we've already encroached on a little bit. Yes, but okay. uh, but uh, I'll allow you to uh, highlight anything we haven't already discussed, and then we can uh, move on. Yeah, thank you. You've got me back again. Um, so yeah, there is some um, crossover. So I'll um, take you through this as, as briefly as I can manage. So um, this report details a capital investment strategy for the next five years and takes into account the revisions to SIPFA's Treasury Management Code and Prudential Code. Um, so in this, we've got the capital strategy, the Treasury st strategy and the commercial strategy. Paragraph five re refers to the capital strategy and prudential indicators de detailed on paragraphs nine to 15 of the appendix. Paragraph nine shows the projected spend and how it's funded and the overall underlying need to borrow, also known as CFR. So um, it's estimated at 12.6 million and shown in um, table two. Uh, which we've already mentioned and confirms that we've no need to externally borrow. Um, investment balances gradually reduce over the medium term um, as a re result of reserves being used to finance the capital programme and also because of our working capital steadily reducing. Um, this is mainly because Section 106 monies in relation to education are no longer paid um, to the council. Um, MRP is detailed at paragraph 16 and 17 and details the council's methodology for the cost of borrowing and the capital expenditure that must be charged to the revenue account. Um, we've also got VRP, um, which is voluntary revenue uh, provision, uh, which can be reduced or removed in the event of financial crisis. From paragraph 18, um, the appendix details a treasury strategy. The key points in this um, again talks about the economic climate and business rates um, set to peak at 4.5 percent before falling again, as we've already discussed. Um, paragraphs 28 to um, 31 details the borrowing strategy, which sets our limits um, for debt, basically the maximum we can borrow and the operational boundary. Paragraph 33 details the new indicator, um, the liability benchmark, which we've just seen in, in quarter three, reflecting the real need to borrow. And again, as we said, illustrates that the council has no need to borrow over the medium term. Table six, um, paragraph 35, shows a proportion of financing costs to the net revenue stream, um, which shows the affordability of the council plans. Again, we've just seen that in the quarter three report. The proportion fluctuates um, in 23-24, it reflects the rapid rise in the interest rates and the downward trend in later years reflects a reduction in MRP payments um, in relation to the arena. Table 7, paragraph 6, um, shows the new indicator again that we just discussed in quarter 3, looking at net income from commercial and serviced investments as a percentage of net revenue streams. It rises over the medium term, reflecting both rent increases and the crematorium. 
Table eight shows the projected investments ranging from approximately 53 million in 2023, decreasing to 41 million. Investments fall over the medium term as resources are used to fund a large capital programme. And as we said, section 106 money is reducing. Paragraphs 50 to 53 look at the current investments. Uh, paragraph 53 details the 15 million held in pool diversified funds, which account for 65% of the council's interest receipts over the past three years, but can be um, subject to fluctuations in capital value. Um, TM limits are set for the purpose of minimising risk. Treasury limits are set by the credit rating shown in table nine. And table 11 at paragraph 56 sets limits on investments by group. Counterparties are approved by the Treasury advisors, and these are shown in Appendix 1. And tables 12 and 13 show the limits on interest rate exposure and maximum investment over one year, which is set as 50% of the sum available for investment. The last part of the strategy is the com commercial investment policy, which is from paragraph 67 to 81 and covers our investments that are primarily for financial gain. Um, as um, PWRB borrowing is no longer permitted, um, there aren't any plans for commercial investment in the capital programme. So this section is only relevant to the existing commercial investments that we have. Um, a key indicator in this is um, the council's reliance upon the commercial income. Um, the limit's set at 30%, and we've just mentioned it's around 20% in reality. Um, paragraph 76 covers the risk exposure <coughs> indicators and depicts how our investments are diversified across the sector in order to minimise risk. Uh, the, 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 the financial environment is facing economic uncertainty and it brings the risk which are covered in the body of the strategy uh, by setting and following the prudential indicators and managing risk through setting limits and diversifying investments the council has set a robust um, capital and investment strategy and um, some of you did attend the treasury training by link and um, will have noticed the endorsement by treasury advisors um, of our proportionate approach to both our treasury and commercial property investments. Paragraphs 82 and 83 cover the importance of both member and officer training, and that will be provided again later this year. Any questions? Katie, okay, thank you for that whirlwind tour uh, of uh, our treasury, <laughs> capital and commercial activities. Uh, uh, which I understood completely, actually, because I've I done my homework. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I've been to the training, yes. So uh, so do we have any comments on the um, the proposed strategy, capital investment strategy for 23-24? I think we have. And uh, I, I suppose, I mean, Katie, if I, if, just as a, a sort of general question, in terms of what's there, most of it looks familiar to me in terms of what we have been doing. So if I was to ask you just to highlight um you know any significant changes in any of those from last year is it pretty much the same i'm gonna have to pass you to sarah on this one because i wasn't here last year um majority of it is like you say very similar our strategy mm. remains the same and um, the only thing that's changed i would say from last year are the interest rate forecasts yeah. is the biggest thing that's changed balances again are similar if not a little bit higher this year than they were probably projected last year and there are uh, two, I think, additional um, indicators, one being the liability benchmark mm -hmm. and one being the net commercial cost, which we were doing something similar anyway um, in that before that came along. And the other thing is uh, that, that the new code proposes is additional training for um, members of the scrutiny group. And um, obviously, we already do the group training anyway, but it's a little bit more tailored to, um, I guess, your needs to be able to scrutinise effectively these sort of reports in this group. So we will be doing an exercise to assess, and we did send something out, I don't know if you recall, I think you filled one in and a few, a few of the other uh, members of the skills group did, audit, yes. a skills audit. Yeah. So we'll be <clears throat> picking that up again, I think probably around May time when we've um, established who's on the group and look to, um, to assess what sort of training needs you need um, and then bring that forward um, later on in the year. Councillor Gellman. So, 
so my skills audit was very blank because my skills are low. So I'll bring back my question. So I think my question is a bit more nuanced than it was. To what extent does the reduction in available to invest relate, because I've heard what you said, does it relate to, you know, reserves being moved into assets like sort of leisure centre, or does it relate to reserves being moved into running costs? It's a little bit of both things, I think. So we've got the um, capital program there that we require. So um, we use it to fund that, but also um, the reserves to top up revenue budgets. Just sorry, can I come back up to what, how much is that basically? How much is going into budgets? In terms of over the pit, well, over the pit, it's a temporary fluctuation. So when we get to the budget on next Thursday, you'll see that over the period, it's about £300,000 net. But there, there might be a fluctuation of £1.2 million out of reserves. And then with a view to replenishing that over the next four years. So it's sort of like temporary. It's not a, a long term permanent use of reserves. It's just temporary to smooth out the um, deficits in the budget. Sorry. And, and, based, and that's based on the assumption that interest rates going to come that um, the interest rates inflation is going to come down is it the it, fact that it's temporary no um no not really i mean it's the overall budget itself so the budget um when we set the budget it incorporates lots of different things so inflation being one of them interest rates on our investments being the other but obviously that's intertwined with lots of other different things going along with projects um not just coming online but also things that are finishing so the budget is moving all the time so we so do yeah so yeah, it's like okay. a detailed process that we go through but yeah ultimately it's, it's the balance of all of those things yeah. that then we're moving to reserve okay uh, we're almost there uh, just one f uh, question about link from me sarah um there was references to uh, their their current um, engagement ending 31st of october what's the procurement timelines to um, we're starting that process um, as we speak, actually. So we are currently putting together our specification of the services that we want, just checking whether there's any any additional things that we might need from them. And then we will um, start the process off formally to hopefully appoint somebody and we'll have somebody in place. Um, the month will be like a handover of a month or so before um, okay. that contract ends. OK, thank you for clarifying. So uh, with the strategy for 23-24, we're asked to... Uh, uh, <clears throat> recommend for approval to council, and that is the capital strategy and capital prudential indicators and limits, uh, which Katie has taken us through for 23, 4 to 27, 28. Uh, the minimum revenue provision MRP statement contained within Appendix A, um, I think we did reference to that, uh, reference that as well. Uh, and also the treasury management strategy for 23, 4. Uh, to 27, 28, uh, and the Treasury indicators, which uh, which we've just been through, and then finally the commercial investment indicators and limits for 23, 4 to 27, 28. So all of those were are within that strategy, uh, unless there are any reasons not to uh, recommend uh, the strategy for approval. We can record that as approved. Okay, thank you. I, I couldn't agree more, Councillor Adair, and I think, you know, debt-free, but also uh, in terms of the performance and, uh, you know, the, these reports, I've been seeing these come in for four years, the uh, capital investment, treasury, our commercial income and, and so on is, is, is very, very good and very positive. And uh, thank you to uh, the team, Sarah, and uh, the team. Councillor Butler. You, well, you, really, really, just to add to that as well, the, 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 the lack of external borrowing, both now and in the past, but also projected that we're... we're it's 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 very unusual to to see that. Indeed, um, indeed. Uh, <coughs> okay, uh, we will move on to now our final item, which is uh, the work program, uh, which I'm sure everybody's got lots of comments on in terms of the intensity of these meetings. But uh, um, Sarah, I'm more than happy for you to uh, make make reference uh, uh, to the forthcoming program, but. I, I, we, we do have this discussion regularly. It, it is very intensive. There's a lot to go through. A lot of it is statutory, legislative or compliance driven, which we can't avoid. We've had some hiccups with, um, I think, delays, as David took us through earlier with the financial statements and so on. But uh, 
it is an intensive program. Is there anything we can realistically do? More <laughs> I don't I don't think we want to suggest more meetings. <laughs> um, but having said that, I know, like you say, the, the June agenda and the September agenda in particular mm. look quite full. Um, tonight's agenda was abnormally large, um, particularly because of the delay in the um, statement of accounts and the audit report, which we would hope won't happen again this year. But having said that, even with those items in, we've still sort of done it within normal time frame so so whilst they look like sort of rather large agendas a lot of them like you say they sort of can be taken together on a quite standard walkthrough mm. items um that you're used to seeing and shouldn't um potentially take up as much time as what it looks like on paper um, the only thing that i will say is that as with this year if the um consultation that's currently out for the closure of accounts is extended the audit um, deadline is likely to also be extended, which means that the statement of accounts is unlikely to go in September, and that will probably bump to November, which um, is the, the likeliest work there yeah. anyway, so, <laughs> so it wouldn't be a bad thing. Yeah. Um, that's probably all I would comment upon at this point. Just okay. the fact that also there is a um, capital investment strategy monitoring now is quarterly. Mm. We started it last year. Um, it wasn't mandatory at that point because the code only recommended it until this financial year. But now it's become mandatory, so we will be taking a quarterly one. Okay. Councillor Butler. I think as an observation on that, obviously so in June it will be very soon into a new council with, with new people for all sorts of reasons. So, uh, I, and, and I, I agree with what you're saying, actually, that the, the type of reports and items you got on here shouldn't be too onerous. And also, if anything, they could be, because you will have new people on this committee, um, it could be part of as bizarre as it sounds, as a training thing, because because you'll be presenting these audit reports, progress reports, etc., and it, it's an opportunity for um, there may not be a lot of well, it might be a lot of questioning actually. It, it could it could easily be because people are new and, and they don't know what it's all about. So I, I think I think it, uh, yeah, at a glance it looks a bit scary, but looking at the type of, uh, of reports you've got on there, I think I, I think it should be all right. Okay, so um, we're almost there, folks. Um, uh, I think based on that, Sarah, what you said is uh, you're still going to give us 346 pages at future <laughs> meetings, but uh, but hopefully we can manage that. Um, this is uh, talking about new councils, Councillor Butler. Um, this is our last meeting of this particular group for this year. Uh, so I'd like to convey my thanks to um, firstly all members uh, of the group who've uh, Who've, uh, who've been part of this committee and uh, taken us through all of these items over the year. Thank you very much for your contributions for attending and uh, all the uh, debates and decisions we've made. And also thank you to all of our officers, um, including Pete, who's gone, Charlotte, Katie, Sarah, and also obviously uh, Tracy over here. And I think we've already noted thanks to David and Mazars and Gurpreet um, from BDO. So, on that note, thank you all. Thank you for, uh, uh, all for your efforts over the air. Have a safe trip home and uh, enjoy the evening. What's left of it? Can I just say, Chairman? Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir.